And then there are, uh, uh, um, what do they call that? Zionist Christians. And he's invited to this conference to speak about how the Bible does not teach Zionism. I mean, you talk about a setup. If you know anything about, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this. It's only a 32-minute video, and I'm like, how is he going to do this in 32 minutes? What's he going to do? And you could tell by watching this, he was a little shaken. I mean, I, he was he was shaken. If you've ever seen Hank Hanegraaff, the man is not shakable. Right? He's like, he knows the Bible. I mean, he was he was reading books of the Bible from memory. Like, that's just what he does. He's so in the Bible all the time that he's like, well, you know, in Exodus chapter 17 through 23, it says, and then he would just be reciting the entire text of the Bible <laughs> from memory. It was amazing. So anyway, watching this guy, and I mean, this is why Protestants loved him so much, and now they hate him. Because uh, <laughs> he, he became Orthodox. They're like, wait, that, is, that's where the, because you know, he said, if you read the Bible, it will lead you to Orthodoxy. That's what he basically said. And then they're like, wait a minute, this is fairly bad. So um, anyway, so Hank Hanegraaff, he's speaking at this thing, and, and I, I would love to, to, to share the link with you somehow so that you can see, because he's there, and he's, he's talking to the, the, the Jewish people about how he's like, you know, the, the promise of this land for you is fulfilled in boom, 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 and he goes through the Bible and quotes all of the places where it's fulfilled. And then, you know, he, he just goes, and then he addresses the Palestinians, and, and he's addressing the Zionists, and he's like, Zionism, there's nothing in the Bible to defend Zionism. He's talking to this conference of Zionists, telling them, I mean, I don't think he had one friend in the whole crowd. And I'm sitting there watching this guy, I'm like, I can't believe he's doing this. It was a, but Hank Hanegraaff, God bless you for doing it. He did an amazing thing. Um, and and I, I want you to watch it if you can, because there's so much confusion about what's going on in the Middle East, and... Who should we be siding with, Israel or Palestine or whatever? And there's just so much confusion. And what Hank does is he just he goes in and he goes into the scriptures and he says, let's just look what the Bible says about all of this. And he breaks it down in a way that everybody in the crowd hated him. So it was he's really good at just speaking the truth. And it was very Athanasian of him. It felt like he was one man against the world in that video. So kudos to Frank, but I, uh, for, to Hank. I watched that today and I, I just thought I would pass that along. I've only heard it. Okay. So I want to talk today about, about Christmas in the Orthodox Church. Now, as a kid, do you remember, do any of you remember the magic of Christmas? Anybody not remember the magic of Christmas? Like, it was a mystical time. There was something going on and it wasn't just Santa Claus. Like, I would sleep under the Christmas tree, and there was I was somehow closer to God there. There was just something you cannot describe about Christmas. And, you know, and they make movies about the Polar Express. Remember the magic of Christmas. <laughs> These things, right? There's, there's all this, you know, money-making and everything else. But there is something anybody who's ever been a child knows. There is something about Christmas that is mystical. Like, it is just... It, it's inexplicable. You can't describe what exactly is going on. And then you start to get older, and then your parents are like, and there's no Santa Claus, and you're like, wait just a second here. It was all this, what is going on here? You know, and then, and then you find out about St. Nicholas, and you're like, well, that's cool. There really is a Santa Claus, but he's a saint in the Orthodox Church. You know, but it's just, there's, there, 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 there's nothing like that, if I can call it magic, it's not magic, we don't but there is that mystery, hoc mysticus, that, that there's that thing that, that Christmas as a child, you are entering into something that is so much bigger than yourself, and you can't even put it into words, but you know it's real. Does anybody disagree with me on this point so far? <clears throat> if you do, there's the door. <laughs> so... And I, I, I say this because I was so, I, I loved Christmas as a child. I, there was always something, you go outside and you look up at the stars and there's just something universe altering that is happening at Christmas. And it's very hard to explain. But as we become Orthodox, we start to realize that, uh, that there, is, there, there is a reality there. There is something there that is beyond um, that is beyond words, and the church has tried 
for so long to put into words and to put into iconography uh, the reality of the mystery. And so I want to just talk a little bit about that tonight um, and say that if you are somebody, as I am, who thinks about those days of being a child at Christmas and wishes you could somehow get back to that place of mystery, because it was, it was an experience of God, there was something going on there. And if, they, if you're like me and you, you want to be back in that place, then you have to enter into the hymnography and the iconography of the church, and you can go there. It's very special. If we talk about texts, early texts from the early church that refer to what happens at Christmas, we can see that in the, uh, in the second century that this author known as James, or pseudo-James, <clears throat> who is writing in the voice of James, the brother of our Lord, right? he's writing as though he were James. He, he wasn't James. <coughs> I don't think it's possible that he was James because James didn't live that long, right? But what the church says is that this man inherited this uh, oral tradition that the church had passed along now for a hundred years. That's what happened, right? The, there were a lot of things that were written down, and then there weren't a lot of things. There were a lot of things that weren't written down, and they were just passed on from family to family, from generation to generation. And finally, this man received this tradition, and he wrote it down, not as someone who heard this who, from someone who heard this from someone who heard this from someone who heard this from the Apostle James. He just wrote it down, and this was a common, this was a common thing in that day. He just wrote it down as though he were James. Same with, like, Dionysius the Areopagite. He's known today as pseudo-Dionysius, because he wrote as though he were Dionysius from the Book of Acts. And his writings will blow your mind away because you're like what on earth is this man saying i mean the depth of his spirituality you're just like this is unbelievable um so but so it's not that he wasn't truly a christian or something he was this incredibly mystically minded devout christian who wrote as though he were dionysius from acts uh he was writing real amazing experiences of god under a pseudonym and so that's, uh, <clears throat> that's what you see in the Proto-Evangelion of James, or the first gospel of James. And James, the writer, James, tries to put into words what is experienced at the moment of Christ's birth. Has anybody ever read this? Okay. It's like, it's like if you, if you, if so, is there a book for the Matrix? It's like if somebody wrote the book, The Matrix, and they were trying to explain everything that happened in the cinematography, and then they were dodging bullets, and their bodies were going like this, and whatever, you know, and, and um, it doesn't really, you know, you can't capture it. Well, this is what was going on in this Proto-Evangelion of James. He's saying, it, he's, he was sent by Joseph to go get the midwives. And so he leaves, he's about, I think, 15 years old is the tradition, he leaves, runs out in the middle of the night to go find the midwives, and as he's going, all of a sudden, the stars stop twinkling. They are, they are shining, they, they, they are twinkling, but not twinkling. And then the birds, is says, the birds, they are flying, but not flying. Right? And he goes through, and he's trying to explain using words what he's seeing. And what he's describing is all of creation pausing and getting stuck for a moment. And then starting, there's an intersection of the divinity with creation. And what happens is, when that happens, there, the, uh, the, there is like, it's like creation goes on pause for a minute, and then everything starts moving again. And he's trying to describe this in words, right? <clears throat> so we can either just dismiss this as some fantastical tale from some second century guy trying to make a name for himself, or... We could take it as the tradition that was handed down for a hundred years, that was finally written down by somebody who is a faithful member of the church, who takes on the pseudonym of James, the brother of our Lord, and says, this is what I experienced. He's saying, 
This is what was experienced by James that was passed down to us. Now, this is fascinating as one piece of the great puzzle, right? The great puzzle of the incarnation. It's fascinating because um, it, it makes sense for us. It makes sense for us that if the pre-eternal God would become incarnate, that that would have some kind of an incredible ripple effect on all of creation, that everything would be affected by that. We see, uh, of course, in the iconography, and I'm not, I, I didn't bring the icons in tonight because I wasn't planning, I'm not planning on doing a full explanation of the iconography of Christmas. But when you see the icons of the nativity, you actually find, yeah, it's up there, nobody can see it. You see a beam of light that comes down, and then there's like a star almost exploding in the center of it, and then it comes down into the cave. What on earth is that? Where is that in the gospel? Right? It's the iconography of the church, by the way, which is heavily influenced by the proto evangelium of James. Like many of the items that you see in the iconography of the of the nativity in the in the early church, they are you're like, wait, where did this take place? In which gospel was this in? You know, you, you see these midwives washing and 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 you see these things happening. You're like, where did this where did all this take take place? It, most of it comes from that proto evangelium of James. And um, and so uh, anyway, the iconography tries to depict the reality of this mystery of the intersection of God and man that takes place in the Incarnation. Uh, you can look at the iconography and, and study that. We'll probably talk more about it um, as we have time as we get closer to Christmas. And how about the hymns? I mean, there are so many. There are so many hymns, and if you listen to the hymns, they are mind-boggling. Because the hymns are not just saying... I mean, there are hymns that just say, you know, you know, oh, pre-eternal word of God, you became incarnate for us and for our salvation and took on flesh of the Holy Virgin Mary and, you know, and, and, and that kind of talk about, oh, this is what happened. But then you've got these great theological hymns, and I just picked out a couple of them tonight. And I, I say this because, number one, I want you to understand that the church is trying to begin to use words and, and images to explain this great mystery of the Incarnation. It's huge in the Orthodox Church, in Orthodox theology. It's huge. Um, you know, in the West, largely the, 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 the great mystery and the great power, uh, uh, the saving power of God is made known on the cross. You know, that's, that's the real focus. And, and certainly, obviously, you see the cross everywhere in the Orthodox Church. But the the... The saving act of the Incarnation is really highlighted in the East in the way that it's not highlighted in the West. So let me just give you a couple of little examples. <clears throat> this is the uh, Troparion for the Four Feasts of the Nativity of Christ. Every priest who's going to serve a liturgy begins the Proscomedia prayers, the prayers, the service where before anybody else is at the church, maybe one other person might be here, but before anybody else is at the church, then the priest begins the service of the proscomedia where he's preparing the bread and the wine, which will be then uh, carried in procession and laid on the altar and then blessed as the body and blood of Christ, right? That, that service of preparation is called the proscomedia, and it's done on a table called the prothesis table. And at the beginning of that service, before the priest does anything else, this is the, serve, the, the hymn that he uh, prays, the, the prayer that he prays. Make ready, O Bethlehem, for Eden has been opened for all. Prepare, O Ephrathah, for the tree of life has blossomed forth in the cave from the virgin. For her womb did appear as a supersensual paradise in which is planted the divine plant, where of eating we shall live and not die as Adam. Truly Christ shall be born, raising the likeness that fell on the Break that down for you just a little bit. Make ready, O Bethlehem. Okay, obviously, Bethlehem is the place where what happened? 
Jesus was born. Jesus was born. And Bethlehem means literally? House of bread. Right. Bait is house. Lechem is bread. Bait Lechem, the house of bread. Okay. Uh, Eden has been opened for all. Wait a minute. So here we are preparing for the, the four feasts. So we're preparing for the nativity of Christ. And we're saying, may ready, O Bethlehem, Eden has been opened for all. In the past tense. Right? So Christ, the pre-eternal word of God, has become incarnate in the womb of the Holy Theotokos and ever-Virgin Mary. He's not even born yet. And the hymn says, prepare, O Bethlehem, for Eden has been opened for all. And it's pretty powerful and wild if you actually think of it. Because he isn't even born yet. Right? He hasn't gone to the cross yet. Make ready, O Bethlehem, for Eden has been opened for all. So the incarnation for us is a big deal. Prepare, O Ephratha. Why Ephratha? Um... There are numerous places in the Old Testament where Bethlehem is referred to as uh, Bethlehem Ephrathah, or it's equated with Ephrathah. There are, I believe, two or three Ephrathahs uh, in that area, and so they're, they're um, designated by you know, Bethlehem of, uh, excuse me, Ephrathah of Judah or whatever. But in this, in this place in particular, this is... Uh, Ephrathah of Zeb Zebulon, which is equated with Bethlehem. That's very confusing, but bless you. Bless you. Okay. Suffice it to say, there are a number of places in the Old Testament where Bethlehem is either equated with Ephrathah or called Bethlehem Ephrathah. Okay. So we've already addressed Bethlehem, and now we're going to address the other name that is given for this place, which is Ephrathah. It says, for the tree of life has blossomed forth in the cave from the virgin. The tree of life has blossomed forth, past tense, has blossomed forth in the cave from the virgin. So we refer to the cross as the tree of life, and here we have Christ being referred to as the tree of life. Listen to this, how we go on from here. In the cave from the virgin. For her womb did appear as a supersensual paradise. It's beyond our senses. There's a mystery. This is the thing that uh, uh, um, Nestorius could not get over. How can the womb contain the uncontainable? He couldn't, he could not say an amen to that. How could if God is if God is uncontainable, how could he be contained in the virgin's womb? How is that possible? And so he called her Christotokos. Because he said, sure, she bore the Christ in her womb, but there's no way that he was God in her womb, because God is uncontainable. Right? So this was the Nestorian heresy, which the church called the council, and uh, the term Theotokos was officially adopted by the entire church at that point. Theotokos, the God-bearer. It is beyond our understanding. Her womb is a supersensual paradise. It is beyond our senses. We cannot possibly understand how the uncontainable God could be contained in that womb. We can't contain, we can't understand. A virginal womb. A virginal womb, no less. Sorry. Right. But we confess that. For her womb did appear as a supersensual paradise. Paradise? A supersensual paradise in which is planted the divine plant. <coughs> So her womb, right, we, we, you've heard me talk a lot over the last couple of months about the Theotokos is the ark. You know, how she is the fulfillment of all of these things in the old covenant. That, that all of these things were types of her to come, which is mind-blowing for me. If you, if you can wrap your mind around it, you can't wrap your mind around it. Don't even try. If we can confess it and say, yeah, well, that's what the church teaches. I believe that. It's like it opens up a whole other layer of, of your soul and your mind. It's, that's, that's, it's like you start to go, oh, she is the ark. I remember saying that in August or whatever it was. I'm like, she is the ark. I'm like, wow, there's, there's no more ceiling in here. Because it's like you say, God gives us these realizations, 
And he says, now, if she's the art, watch this. <laughs> Ripple effect everywhere, right? Been rocking my world ever since. And I know this Orthodox teaching. Most of you guys had that figure out a long time ago, but I'm a very slow learner. Just ask my wife. She'll tell you I'm a little slow sometimes. Molasses on a cold winter day. Okay, so I know I'm being generous. <laughs> For her womb did appear as a super sensual paradise. So her womb is paradise. Her womb did appear as a paradise beyond our senses. We cannot understand how this happened. And in that paradise of her womb is planted the divine plant. Tree of life. And then we go back to the Bethlehem theme. Where of eating we shall live. Beit Lechem, the house of bread. Jesus is the bread that came down from heaven. He is the manna. She is the ark. He is the manna within the ark. Eating of him, the tree of life, the divine plant, we shall live. He who does not eat my flesh and drink my blood has no life in him. But eating of him, we shall live and not die as Adam died. And then it says, truly Christ shall be born, raising the likeness that fell of old. Right? Because in the garden, we were created in the image and likeness of God, placed in the garden and when we chose to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then the fathers would tell us that even though we're created in God's image and likeness, something happened at that point, and the likeness of God in us became distorted. <coughs> we, we partook of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we began to see good and evil, right? Surely in that day you will be like God. We began to see good and evil, but we were not prepared for that. If we were prepared for it, we wouldn't be in this mess that we're in that we call our humanity. In this world that is full of sin. So it says, Christ shall be born, raising that likeness that fell of old. Christ, in the incarnation, he becomes, in the, the, in, in the womb of the virgin, he becomes, the church calls him, the new Adam. He is like us in every way except sin. And when we partake of him in the Holy Eucharist, then we are partaking of life. We are being given life. We are being raised to life. So that's the Treparion for the four feast of the Nativity. Now let me just ask you, why would every priest everywhere read that prayer before beginning the proscomedia service at every liturgy? I've been thinking about it for 17 years. Every time I say it, I try to really mean it. I really try to mean these words because I know that this prayer, and I just read it and explained it to you, and I'm going to tell you for the rest of my life, I'm going to be understanding it more it's, and more each time because that's how it works. I would think it's because of the, it's the talking about partially talking, or at least partially talking about the Eucharist, and you're preparing the Eucharist mm -hmm. plus communion. Right. And you know what? Icon is above every prothesis table in every church, everywhere. Oh, yeah, it, it is the nativity, right? Yeah, it's the nativity icon. It's the icon of the nativity, right? It's really deep, isn't it? So, the mystery there, there, we talk about the mystery of Christmas. No. And I still walk out on, on Christmas night every year. You look up at the sky. I'm not worshiping the stars. <laughs> I walk out. I stand beneath the stars, and I'm in. I'm just in awe. These are the same stars that were twinkling that stopped that night for a moment. Those are the same stars that looked down upon Christ being born. 
the same group, the same ones. They didn't change. They didn't like get wandered and, and we got no ones in them. These are the same ones. And we stand under that sky. You know, the mystery of, of eternity is laying out, it's laid out before us. Who can just who can explain the infinitude of the universe? Who can explain that? It's inexplicable. You can't explain it. Nobody can. I have never heard a scientist say, well, this is how that all works. They don't know. They have no idea. None of us do. Which is why I like to go out on Christmas and stand out and look at that sky. It's the same stars. The same stars under which Christ was born. The same stars under which he lived. The same stars uh, beneath which he was buried right, after he was crucified. The same stars that must have seen some flash coming from that tomb on that Pascha morning a couple thousand years ago. Same stars. There is a mystery there that is real. We don't try to talk ourselves into something like it's a small world. You, know? you go into Disneyland. You try to psych yourself up. There's a world of laughter. <laughs> you try to get excited. You go, go into fantasy world for a little while. Because you want to forget about your tough job or your bad home life or that difficult test that's whatever. <clears throat> that's why like fantasy worlds and stuff like that, they can sweep us in. For a few minutes, we forget our problems. <clears throat> In the church, I mean, when we come to the church on Christmas Eve, we are mystically coming to the king. That's what's happening. This is what the church teaches us. I'm not trying to make everybody feel good by making up stories. Right? We come to the church to celebrate Christ being born now. Same thing on Pascha. Why is it so exciting for us to come in the middle of the night? Why is everybody crying when we nail Christ on the cross? Why does everybody feel down on Saturday? I don't want to do anything. Why don't we just go shopping? We can't. Because our Savior is laid in a tomb. And we know he rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. But the reality is, it's not... It's not liturgical drama. There is certainly some drama, you know, to the Holy Thursday service, you know, the procession and the nailing. And I mean, man, it's the best liturgical drama of all time. It's amazing, you know. But it's, it is the fact, the reality is that we are entering into that act that took place. You know, God is outside of time. And when we come to the church and we say, blessed is the kingdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You've heard me say this. It is as though the walls of the church were to disappear and that the great cloud of witnesses is surrounding us and we are joining the heavenly liturgy that's taking place. That liturgy is outside of time. So we're joining with that liturgy in real time because there's no time. It's a mystery. We can't break that down on paper and say, here's the equation, watch this. It doesn't work like that. But why is it that there are so many priests and people too who have experienced things that are beyond explanation while standing at the altar. And there are. And I'm not going to give you a big list of things. Um, but, you know, the reality is that on Christmas, if we want to have that childlike faith, that, that faith of the child, you know, sleeping under the Christmas tree, or you know, staring up at the stars, or that, that childlike faith that says, tonight I'm celebrating the birth of Christ. I'm at the cave. You know? Then we can have access to that beautiful, simple reality within the, the liturgical life of the church. So, you know, I, when Jesus says things like, unless you become like one of these little children, these suckling babes, these ones who rely upon me, who don't even know, know the questions to ask, they just know that they rely upon me like a mother for their warmth and their comfort, their protection, their sus sustenance. You know, he says, unless you become like one of these, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. He wants us to have that kind of a dependence upon him for everything and to experience that mystery of being in his presence 
uh, in the, the, the life of the church and the services of the church. So I hope that makes sense to you, what I'm, what I'm trying to say. I don't want to over, uh, uh, over explain it because it's, it's, you, ex you can't explain it. But it is reality. It's why uh, I had one parishioner who um, for, was from Greece, and he went to uh, went back to Greece on the Dormition of the Theotokos, mm -hmm. and he had the liturgy for the Dormition. And he walked outside and he looked up, and the whole sky was blue, almost like the Northern Lights. It was just blue. I have no reason to doubt this man. No reason at all. He's never told me anything but absolute truth. Why on earth would the night sky be blue? It's, un it's not explainable. There was something going on in the church. There was a real celebration of this, uh, an entering into of the Dormition of the Theotokos, and blue is her color, by the way, if you didn't know that. And for the sky to turn blue at night, there was obviously something going on differently, different than just remembering somebody from 2,000 years ago. That's like the, I'm told, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, Mount Tabor. Went to Mount Tabor when I was over there uh, in the in the Middle East, and we went up to the monastery. The, the top of the mountain is divided. Roman Catholics have this massive church and a monastery up there, and the Orthodox have this little church and a monastery up there. <laughs> and that's all that's on top of the mountain. Massive Roman Catholic structure, little Orthodox, ancient, teeny little. And so we went up there, and you know, you drive past this just humongous modern uh, Catholic church, and just huge thing. And you drive past that, and you get to the the, uh, the Orthodox site, and it, it was interesting because um, there was an article I read uh, either just before, or just after I went up there. I think maybe it was just before about a man who was a pilgrim, and he went to the Middle East, and he went to Israel. And he wanted to go to Mount Tabor on the Feast of the Transfiguration. And so he went up on Mount Tabor, and it was, I think with a couple of Roman Catholic friends, and they went, and you know, the service was going on or whatever. And he thought, oh, this is interesting. You know, this is really strange being here on this mountain on this night. And he goes outside, middle of the night, and it's like daylight. He's confused. He says, what, on the, what, what in the world is going on here? And so the source of light is coming from next door. He goes over, and goes over, and he kind of walks into the place, and he says, "What is this place?" And they said, "Well, this is the Orthodox Church." And he says, "What's going on?" They said, "We're having the liturgy for the Transfiguration." He says, "Why is there a big bright cloud above the church in the middle of the night?" And they said, "Well, that happens every every year on the Transfiguration." <laughs> he says. Come, it's not over the Roman Catholic Church. The priest says, I don't know. <laughs> it's not my fire. Every year. How come you never hear about that on CNN? Uh, how about the Holy Fire? Right? Every year. Holy Saturday. Every year. Fire comes down from heaven and lights the patriarch's candle inside the sealed tomb of Christ with Muslim, Muslim guards at the door. Every year. That's quite a story. <laughs> Every single year. It's been documented for a thousand years, and before that, St. John Chrysostom make, alludes to the light, the blue light in the tomb on Pascha. Um, that's another 500 years before that, right? So we don't know how many, how long this has been going on, but a long time. So the point I'm trying to make, of course, is that on the day, you know, that's why we don't come to church and sing, Happy Birthday, Dear Jesus, Happy 2000th Birthday to you. <laughs> right? I mean, some churches do that. They will actually sing "Happy Birthday to Jesus" on Christmas. That's what they think they're doing. We don't. We're not coming for a birthday party. We're coming to the cave. We are there at the birth. So that's the that is the when we talk about the mystical theology of the Orthodox Church, and we it's not we can just make it up. I mean, Saint Paul says things that will blow your mind. My favorite that he says is when he talks about. Well, I mean, there's so many you could. But I love the one where he talks about, the, the, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two should become one flesh. And he says, it's a great mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ and the church. Anyway, and then he moves on. And I'm like, wait a minute, what did he just say? What did he just say? He said, a man and a woman, they get married, and they two become one. And it's a great mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ and the church. 
Can you follow that in your mind and see what he's the connection that he's making there? I mean, it's unbelievable what he's saying there. You know. Um, so anyway, I won't I won't keep going on that because there's so much to be said. But Saint Paul was this. And, well, and Saint Peter too. My goodness, I was going to say Saint Paul is this apostle of mystery, but Saint Peter is too. I mean, they all are in a way. But you know, Saint Peter talking about becoming a partakers of the divine nature. What? What are, what are we talking about? We're not talking about happy birthday, dear Jesus. We are talking about stepping outside of what we can sense, the super sensual paradise. We're talking about stepping outside of our senses and coming in reality to the event and partaking in this event that has taken place in real time, that we, we get to come and participate in that because when we come to the church, we are joining together with the heavenly choirs at the altar of God, which is outside of that. Okay. If I haven't confused anybody, then glory to God for all things. <laughs> that's what I was, I was going to go over another hymn and stuff, but I think that's enough. And I, if anybody has any questions, I can do my best to answer them. Do have any questions? What was your other hymn? That was the Doxasticon uh, for the four, four feasts of the Nativity. I'll say I'll read it for you, okay? Okay. Dance, O Isaiah. Yeah. They're they're outside of time in their own reality, right? <laughs> <laughs> they're like speaking of outside of time. Sorry. Bedtime. No, I'm. I'm I God bless you. Dance, O Isaiah. Receive the word of God. Prophesy to the maiden Mary that the bush will burn with the fire of the splendor of the Godhead, yet will be not consumed. No mystery there. Make ready, O Bethlehem. Open thy gate, O Eden. Proceed on your journey, you magi, that we may behold our salvation swaddled in a manger. Behold. That's in the present tense. We are coming to behold. Above the cave, the star proclaims him who is the life bestowing Lord, who saves our race. Above the cave, the star did proclaim? No. The star does proclaim, and actually I believe the tense is did, does, and will. Proclaim him who is the life bestowing Lord who saves our race. That was the other hymn. Do you know who the author is of that hymn? I don't. Uh, my guess would be Romanos and Saint Romanos. So Saint Romanos wrote the first. And I just was going to say that I feel as though the Kentucky, it was the Kentucky, right? The second one? The first one, the preparatory. That was the Troparian for the Four Feasts. The Four Feasts, okay. Um, it's, it's essentially, um, a set, I feel, a second creed for us. There's, there's no part of the, of the scriptures that is not somehow touched upon in these hymns. You have... First of all, um, indication after indication that, that God is outside of, entirely outside of time and uncontainable by anything, including time. And yet, he chooses what can be viewed as the least in the world. <clears throat> For example, um, an unwed young girl prepared from before before time of course chosen from before time and then his servant Romanos Saint Romanos whose voice nobody liked who gives this gift to the church for all time who is it's it's um, you can see so many um, lessons and reminders um, the, just the just the idea 
that the location, the physical location of Christ's birth would be referred to in more than one way. And the calling of groups of people who are so diverse, they have nothing to do with one another and everything to do with one another because they're, they're created children of God. What's for dessert? Excuse me. What's for you dessert? You may go have a great time. <laughs> Still awake. I don't want to talk about it. I mean, he, he's speaking to, between these two hymns, we have everybody from Isaiah to the Magi <clears throat> to the creation itself. Hey. Hey. That's three. Um, <laughs> it's, it is, um, I feel as though, like, um, a creed that the salvation of Christ is for all mankind from the beginning, from the foundation of the world, and eternally. You have references between these two to his actual birth, to his actual ascension of the cross, his, and his death on the cross, and his redeeming Adam. At the same time, really a reference to the Annunciation, which in time is, precedes his birth. And there's a confession in all of this that to participate in the saving grace of Christ, that it is not expected that anybody Don't would understand. Ask her. Excuse me. Don't ask her what? She's tuning she's you in. He has Just, I know what he has. I can count. Thank you. I pretended not to know. Oh. It's fine. Uh, where is the. I'll take care of it. You better eat all the crumbs. Mm -hmm. um, hold on a sec. Sorry. My thinking was organized, sort of. Um, oh, the, it, it, is, it is assumed that one would not, in order to be able to participate and receive, um, it, it is not presumed that you would also be understanding all of this. There was so much impossibility declared um, and, and confessed. And I think that Sergius, of course, is completely right that the reason that this is one hymn that every priest confesses on behalf of himself and the faithful and the church militant as he is preparing to prepare the gifts Okay, it's because he's preparing the gifts. But also because he's entering into a visible, physical icon of the celestial reality. And I, it, it seems to me that it would make a great deal of sense that he, on behalf of the faithful, is suspending the bounds of rational thought. I mean, these hymns mix tenses constantly, and they're not that long. I mean, this is not a tome. This is a hymn. And there are references to Adam and what will come and what has been done um, before and during and following Christ's gestation. So I, I see in the hymns surrounding the Nativity a very condensed um, confession <coughs> of all of our theology and I, 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 it makes sense to me that that same confession would be present visually in the iconography. In the hymnography, the hymnography is so important. Hymnography is like iconography and liturgics and catechism. You could teach to your child whether you had a paintbrush or not or a printing press or not or a priest in the family or not. The hymns are our catechism, auditorial, throughout the year, throughout the year. And you can't possibly attend the feasts and attend matins. I know everybody has difficult times in church. That's just part of being us. But there's, there can't possibly be any boredom. The second we understand <laughs> that we are... We are, we are uncoupled from sin by a God whose love is so great and unfathomable that he not only chose to become like us, he could have become like us beginning at age 18. 
He became like us from the beginning. And he took his time saving us. He took his nine, ten months in the womb. He took his adolescence. He took his time building relationships. He took his time in, in time, inside of time, which he creates to save us. And that is why it makes perfect sense to me that all of creation that's paying attention, right? Unlike man most of the time. All of creation that knows that its creator would would pause how can you continue doing what you would normally be doing when the savior is now for the first time visible to men right this changes everything changes everything the second you can look on his face there's nothing you can't say anything is impossible to god right Thank you. I'm going to end with Malachi chapter 5. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, called uses both there. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old. From everlasting. Of course, that is referring to the coming Messiah. All right. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I have two. Okay. So the first one is just the theory. I just want to know if it would line up with orthodoxy or not. Okay. Um, if God isn't like constrained by time, when we become saints, like when we who are seeking the Lord and we become saints, would we also not be? that be why like do you believe like or we're at the cave like would we like be at the caves like then because we're not constrained by time that's the one it's deep it's a good question so <clears throat> i'm going to say um number one i don't know okay but if you look theologically at the teaching of the church if we died in the waters of baptism and then we are raised to new life and we are participating in the resurrected life of Christ, right, then um, certainly it, it makes sense in a mystical way how we can see that we, we, we know of multiple saints who do things that don't make any sense to us in chronological fashion. How can saints be in two places at once? Like this has happened, documented multiple times historically. That this priest is in Jerusalem serving liturgy for Pascha and he is on Mount Sinai. How is that possible? I have no idea, right? But somehow, God intervened and this person was, they call it bilocating. This person's able to be in two places at once. Uh, you know, look at, 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 at Philip in Acts, in the Ethiopian eunuch, and he baptizes the eunuch and then he's swept up and he's swept away. Um, so, and then, you know, stories like St. Porfirios, who took a phone call yeah, that's what I was about to say. from about one of his spiritual children who didn't know that he had died, and he has a counseling session with him on the phone, and then he says, uh, don't call me anymore, I'm already dead. Click. And hangs up the phone. He doesn't have a phone, he doesn't have a body. How in the world was he talking on the phone if he doesn't have a body? How can you explain that? But we have so many, uh, and of course, I talked last week or two weeks ago about St. Nectarios. Serving Pascha liturgy and Bright Week services in a village years, decades after he had died. How in the world is that possible that he was there in his body and his vestments serving a liturgy? Nobody knew what was going on. Uh, it's good. And of course, you know, I mean, you know, the, the number of priests who have been spotted at the altar, whether here or at other churches who have gone on before us to their rest, but they're standing there, you know. So uh, I, I am always careful to draw really, really succinct lines about, like your theory, it's a good theory, but you'll never see that, I don't think, dogmatized anywhere because it's mystery. But what you say certainly seems to make sense in many, many ways, you know. 
Um, so thank you. This is what we used to sit on the porch in Alaska under the stars and talk about these kinds of things. You're not going to write dogmatics about it, but you sit in there and you say, wait a minute, if this is true and this is true, then wow, could this be true? Good stuff. Good stuff. Saturday Night Live used to call it deep thoughts with Jack. Then you were talking about us not being bound by time because Christ is not bound by time. Was that the last right. essentially? Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, gotcha. One thing that I thought of, and I can't give a specific example, but I know that I have read instances of people being visited. This I just think is so awesome. Okay, like everything else. But I think it is so awesome that an individual can report an experience of being visited by maybe two saints simultaneously who lived. I know, I know. Stop, stop. No. Did, how much did you eat at the house? Stop. Wait. None. None? He had a bowl of Okay. Go get a plate right from up there now. Up on the thing. Um, to somebody being vi uh, visited by a pair of saints who were not contemporaries of one another in this life. Right. They like lived like 900 years apart. Right. And for some reason, and the saints aren't necessarily having a conversation <laughs> with the person who's, who's being ministered to, um, but it's clear that they are, they are sharing this mission. There's a reason that, that each of them is being um, allowed to visit this individual, but they they were not contemporaries of one another. You have Moses and Elijah, right, prepare, uh, appearing simultaneously with Christ on on the mountain, and you know. So I I just think that you know, with God, all bets are off, right? With I mean. We have seen tumors go like this. We've seen we've seen people um, report things that just you know there's there's really nothing that he can not choose to do. And, and when we have visitations of saints, I mean the the saints are obviously not operating bound by time, right? Like and, that, and, go ahead. Like the five year old girl, wherever she was, the like the earthquake. Oh, St. Manus. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and St. Manus, the Wonder Worker. Right. Well, and I, I, I was um, just thinking about, too, the other thing for us is that we, we have such a hyper-rational mindset, whether we want it or not, growing up in the West. We have such a hyper-rational mindset. We have, to, we have to realize that that is not the proper mindset for us. It's the mindset in which we grew up, so it makes sense to us. But when I was over in the Middle East... You know, I mean, for, for them, like, the thought of miracles was like, oh, of course. Like, when, I, when my knee, knee got healed at the Weeping Icon over there in, uh, in, in Jerusalem, and, you know, and I told somebody, I was like, yeah, I was, and I was praying, blah, 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 and they're like, of course, yes, of course. <clears throat> like that, oh, why wouldn't you be healed? That was, the, that was the reality. I mean, and that was a little bit shocking to me. Uh, but you know, it it for me it took my being there two and a half weeks before I was enough in that mindset of faith that I could be healed. Um, so anyway, that's but that's really important. Our mindset, all things are not on the same plane. Our mindset is so different than people who have been living in a, a persecuted reality, struggles, and you know, working for everything and being surround being being all around these places of of miracles, you know. And it was St. Gregory of Nyssa who tells the people to stop spending all their money on pilgrimages. Take that money and give it to the poor. Go to church. The same miracles that have happened in the Holy Land can happen at your church. That was St. Gregory of Nyssa, which I think is, I mean, you know, it's coming from me who took a pilgrimage for three weeks to the Holy Land and had a phenomenal experience there. But his point is well taken. His point was well taken. Yeah, yeah so uh, just praying is... Christina, as you were talking, I was kind of praying like, well, Lord, you know, what What can I share? And I thought of my dad. He died on November 14th um, a few years ago. And uh, there's a lot of problems that I'm dealing with internally, right? So I went on my deck. I live out on a farm, wooded area out east on 3rd, take 3rd east. 
And so I went outside in November. So it was like now very, very cold winter like today. And I was praying to God with this dilemma, right? A lot of internal strife. And I'm praying about my dad and where is he and what's going on and, you know, all this. And I look up and a butterfly, or I told you, some kind of flying butterfly comes out of a winter sky like today and is flying around me on my deck. And I'm alone and I'm looking at this. And it is flying there for a long time. Oh, wow. And I'm not, I'm not I'm intoxicated, hallucinating, <laughs> and uh, pretty cold. For it's butterflies. pretty cool. For it's it, it didn't pretty dawn, cool. it didn't dawn on me what was happening, <laughs> but I thought I should tell you because I don't exactly know. I just felt like it was, in a weird way, a postcard from my dad. Like you know, I'm not exactly, you know, I, I don't know, but but the weird thing how it continued. I told the kids, and I'm telling you, I know, but believe it or not, for like three months straight, I'd be in the kitchen and we had a small butterfly flying around. I said, girls, do not kill that little thing. And it would fly around for like three months in the house. I don't know if I told you that, the ending of it. But I still don't, you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of weird because now Joel or someone will see a butterfly and they're like, there's grandpa! <laughs> So that's an so, icon. So, so what is the butterfly a symbol of in the church? Transformation, death, and resurrection. Right, resurrection of Christ. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And, so. and that, so it's kind of a sign to help me in a dark desert really bad. It's really cool. I just thought that would help you. Thank you for sharing that. Hopefully, hopefully. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm big on butterflies now. Yeah. All right. So we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna wrap it up. Is there something... Okay, so we're going to wrap it up. Let's say a prayer and go home. And again, if anybody has any suggestions or topics, one person has emailed me.